It's one of the top five most commonly used verbs in Latin. And what it is, interestingly, is a combination of a root that means be able and a verb that means to be. So sum in Latin means I am. And the pos is really pot. Okay, it's pot sum, just like ad become, would become assume. Okay? Um, so the pot is the root that means be able. And then the sum means I am. So posum means I am able. Okay, so there are lots of very important words in English that come from this root. All right, pardon the pornography on the screen at the moment. Um, this is called a herm from ancient Greece, and believe it or not, this was a mileage marker, just like if you go on the road, on the highway, especially you know, out in the sticks, and you run across uh, a sign that says mile 262, mile 261 if it's going backwards, or 260, you know, three if it's going forward. Um, what does that do? It tells you how far you are from, away from pretty much your, your next goal, all right? Well, in ancient Greece, they had a version of that, and this was supposed to be a depiction of Hermes, the god Hermes, and it was, no one knows for sure why it has the erect phallus uh, on it. Uh, you know, is it a fertility celebration, some kind of worship thing? Nobody knows for sure. Everybody, you know, a lot of people guess. Um, but the idea is there it was, the idea of potency, the idea here is that when a human being um, or any other you know, sexual being um, is potent, it means you can, pardon the expression, get it up, okay? And that's what the Herm is doing, all right? Um, and so why is that? Because it means you're able, what? Able to mate. What does that mean? Able to have children. Why is that important? Because able to propagate the population, blah, 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 and it goes on up into nations and all that kind of stuff, okay? We already talked about the Popolus. All right, potency, as you know, because you know the suffixes, means state of being able to get it up. If you can't, like this poor fellow being judged by this woman who is not satisfied, I'm guessing, if we're going to look at this as a narrative, I, you know, what, what can I tell you? Um, uh, what is going on here? Not potent. It doesn't mean inside of potency. It means not potent, and it means the state of if it's impotence. Okay, she's a little pissed, and he's down on himself, and do we need to comment any longer on this? Why not impotency? Well, it's impotence, isn't it? Why is it potency and impotence? A good example of the seemingly arbitrary nature of, of these uh, choices, and uh, no one knows for sure, and no one pretty much can know unless you go back in time, and even then you can't because it's a process. It's not just one person deciding it, most likely. All right, sorry for the unseemly subject matter of all that stuff. Okay, now we go to impotent. Now we're taking the idea of being able into more rarefied heights, okay? And if you talk about the impotence of, say, a god, um, what are you saying? You're saying that that god or goddess is all powerful, literally, okay? So omnis, which we may or may not um, isolate later in the semester, means all, omnis, like omnidirectional microphone, means all directional microphone, for example. All right, all powerful. And just as a little um, trivium for you, the ancient Greek <coughs> gods, the Olympians, living in Olympus, even Zeus, were not omnipotent. They weren't all powerful. They weren't able to affect anything they wanted to. And they weren't, by the way, omniscient, that is, all knowing. Okay, they didn't know everything. They didn't know, for example, when mortals would die. Um, the fates did. And a lot, you know, a lot of people make a big deal out of that. The fact that even Zeus was less powerful than the fates um, when it came to being able to know what's gonna go on in the universe. And the fates happen to be female, by the way. So there's a lot of interesting gender stuff going on uh, when it comes to um, omnipotence and omniscience uh, and, and the ancient Greek conception of mythology and, and the gods and the heroes and all that kind of stuff. All right, so when we talk about the potential energy of drawing a bow back, you have that tension. You have that tension that can lead to the realization of, of um, energy 
by letting go of the bow. Potential energy means energy that can happen, but hasn't yet. So it's, it's uh, kind of um, able to happen, but hasn't yet. And to realize it is to make it real. And then when something is possible, we know that the able or able means able. So able to be able, whatever. Okay, that's kind of weird. You're saying able twice there. Possible is able to be able. Impossible, not able to be able. To do what? To come, you know, to go to the top of this rock, say. Now we get to a, a kind of all-purpose word for someone who is in power. Not only a monarch or ruler, um, but anyone in power can be referred to as a potentate. Um, and the eight, in this case, doesn't mean do or make. Just like in can mean in, into, against, um, or not. Um, so the eight ending, mark this down with an asterisk in your notes, okay? Because it's going to happen more than once. When the eight is not part of a verb, but rather some other part of speech, such as a noun or, um, in this, as in this case, or an adjective, then it doesn't mean do or make. It means whatever it means in that particular word. It's an ad hoc thing. So in this case, it means one who, but it's not as common a suffix that means one who as, for example, O-R or E-R is, okay? So, so, or I-A-N, like musician or debtor, okay? So potentate, there'll be lots of words where the eight doesn't mean one who, but in this case it does. So what does the potentate mean? It means one who, strictly speaking, it means one who is able, one who is able. But then by extension, idiomatically, when you talk of a potentate, you're talking about someone who not only is able in a general sense, but someone who what? Has power. Someone who is able to hold power over others. Okay? So it's a particular ability. And that's what I mean by idiomatic. I'm going to use the adjective idiomatic throughout the semester in order to refer to a specific phenomenon. And let me just explain what I mean by it. I would say that usually the words that we encounter in this class based on the roots and the prefixes and the suffixes that we know can be figured out fairly easily just by knowing those elements. But sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you need to be in on the language in kind of um, analogously to when you're in on a joke. If someone says, you know, someone walks in the room and you look at them and they go, hey, 65, ah, and they laugh their butt off. And everybody else is like, 65, that's just a number. What's so funny about that, right? That's hilarious for those people who are in on that joke. Sometimes you have to be in on the language in order to understand what a word really means as opposed to only um, where it comes from. So do not think that by knowing the etymology of the words that we encounter in this class throughout the semester, it's necessarily going to make you know what the word means. Idiomatically, um, what, what that means is if someone from Mars comes down to Earth and you throw the word potentate at them and you tell them that pot and pos means to be able as a root, are they going to be able to get, guess what potentate means? No. Okay? Because then all they're going to think it means, assuming they know what the eight thing means, okay, and that's another story, is they're going, to mean, they're going to think it means someone who is able. Someone who is able to do something. Okay? Kind of like Homo habilis, right? named uh, before Homo sapiens. Um, what does it mean? It means the able person. Not man, by the way. Um, the able person, Homo habilis. Okay? Um, and that means able person in a general sense. Able to use tools, able to do things. Okay? In this case, no. It means able what? Something in particular. Able to hold sway over others. That's what this means. Okay, so that's an idiomatic use of the root as opposed to a more literal use of it. And we're gonna encounter those throughout the semester. Okay, so there's Louis XIV, um, interesting guy right before the French, not right before, but before the French Revolution leading up to it. Um, he held um, absolute power, autocratic rule, uh, just means uh, rule by himself um, in France in the 17th uh, century B, uh, AD. Okay, so another word, that incorporates this idea of power and ab ability is plen means full, like plenty. When there's plenty of something, it means full of something. And potentiary, again, there's the use of a suffix that means one who that isn't that commonly used that way. So in this case, I wouldn't ask you what the suffix is. But then the pot, as you see, means to be able. So what does it mean? It means one who 
is given the power, given full power, to represent whatever government they stand for, as in this case. He's the plenipotentiary. He's the guy who is vested with temporary power to stand for whatever country he comes from. Okay, so we'll call it East and West here to generalize it. Okay, not a commonly used word, but you will encounter it in the media every once in a while. There's the plenipotentiary of Holland, whatever, the guy who's able to stand in for Holland, kind of representative or ambassador is, is kind of the idea. And then the last word here, but that doesn't mean the last thing today. There's one other thing after this, so hang in there, is in French, pouvoir, okay? That means literally power in French, and so that's how this seemingly innocent word in English, power, comes from that pot and pos root. It's through French, as is quite often the case, through Old French, and so power, even though it looks so different from the pot and the pos, um, comes from that root. And here you have Thomas Paine, one of the revolutionaries before the, the war. The strength and power of despotism, which means um, monarchy, kingship, um, consists wholly in the fear of resistance. Clar, which comes from Latin clarus, meaning literally clear. And that's where we get the word clear, through Old French. So ho hopefully you should already be getting a sense that when vowels change from something like an A to an EA, um, that means it's going through the strainer of Old French. So it's from Latin through Old French. <clears throat> okay, so there you go. What, is cl what does clarus mean in Latin? It means clear, like I said, but what does clear mean? Clear means light can get through it. Okay, if you think about it, we know the difference between transparent and translucent, right? Transparent means you can see through something. Translucent means you can see light through it. Right? So you can have a kind of frosty glass that is translucent, but not transparent. Light is sh shining through it, but you can't read through it. Okay? Something, something transparent, you can read through it. And that's kind of what's going on here with clear. Clarus in Latin means translucent. It doesn't mean transparent. It means light can get through it. Okay? So um, when we talk about clarus in Latin, we're, talk, we're literally talking about light being able to get through something as opposed to it not being able to, so as opposed to it being opaque. Opaque would be the opposite of clar, clarus. And so the word clear in English comes directly from clarus for obvious reasons, the EA shift. And then when you talk about clearance, there are different ways you can do so. Probably what we're most um, used to is when we hear of a clearance sale all right, when something that literally means that you're clearing out the inventory of a store, whether it be because they're re-inventorying or they're going out of business, usually. In a less particularized sense, clearance simply means being, right, the ENCE, just like E-N-S or E-N-C-E, being clear. So having a clear space, when you're talking about the clearance of a bridge, such as clearance what does that say, 12 feet, seven inches, <clears throat> the clearance of a bridge, that has to do with how much space there is for a vehicle to go through it. Uh, and that's why it's called that, okay? So, so um, the coast is clear for that truck just barely. Okay, there aren't gonna be too many words that come from this route, but since this is what the document is called, the Declaration of Independence, I thought it, it's definitely worth uh, isolating, but we'll get through it pretty quickly. We're gonna spend more time on the next two routes. Okay, so clarity, we know that the Y at the end, when it's a noun, means state of or being. So it means the state of being clear, clarity. Okay, now you'll notice clearance is another way of saying state of being clear. The only difference being that the ence is French, um, as you can tell from the EA, comes from the A, um, whereas clarity comes um, from Latin claritas. Okay, so when you have the Y ending on nouns in English, I didn't tell you guys this, but um, it's true, um, that, that it usually is a reflection of um, the way that um, a given adjective is turned into a noun in Latin itself. So clarus in Latin means clear, and claritas um, means clarity, and the AS turns into a Y. Okay, and that's why the A in clarity doesn't turn into an EA because it doesn't go through French. Kind of interesting. 
right? So clarity doesn't go through French and clearance does. And it's two different ways of, to a Martian, saying the same thing, right? But idiomatically, because we're in on what English does, we know that even though on paper, clearance and clarity look exactly the same in terms of what's going on between the root and the suffix, you know, the suffix in both cases means being or state of, but here it's two different ways of using that combination to mean two different things. There's a difference between clearance and clarity, although they're kind of related, right? There's clarity in the sense of there's a clear passageway for the vehicle to get through the bridge. If you want to force things, you could think in that way, but they're different. They mean different things, even though they come from the same elements, and yet there, you know, there's yet another um, example of the malleability of English, you know, the, the flexibility of English to be able to create so many different words using what on paper seem to be identical elements. Okay, then when you clarify something, what are you doing? You're clarifying your view of the ocean by using this, um, this lens, making it clear. We know that the phi, F-Y, means to do or make, so in this case it would be to make clear, to make something clear. And obviously, when we uh, talk about it, not in a physical sense, but rather in a um, mental sense, we talk about clarifying an idea. You know, you say something to someone, they don't get it, and what do you do? You do the best you can to explain yourself. Explain yourself, interesting. Explain. Out, and then plain, just means flat. To make things flat, to make things not complicated. Explain is kind of related. Um, semantically to this idea of clarification and clarifying. Okay, so you clarify something, you make it clear. And clarification, because we know that the ION is, the, is how you form nouns out of verbs, that's where you have clarification. Okay, so clarify is the verb, phi means do or make, the shun or the uh, ION, either one, if you put that um, as the suffix, would be correct. Um, that means state of or being. Okay, then. Um, to clarify your goals, you know, to make them clear, um, to set goals, to set them down in stone rather than just be impressionistic about them. That's another way of considering that word. Okay, then you get um, this uh, verb declare, and then the noun built from it, declaration, and that's where you get declaration of independence. So what does declare mean? The first thing to point out about declare, very interestingly, and I wasn't able to go very deep into why it is, um, and I'm sure there's more room for doing so. Um, and that is that there are so few uh, ways to make <clears throat> verbs out of this clar root. And declare is by far the most common one. Declaring, setting down, clarifying, but down in a, in a at least semi-permanent, or in our case, hopefully permanent form. If we try to be literal about it and we say to clear down, you know, we talk about clear out a room. You clear out a room, right? You clear it out. That's, that's uh, different, okay? But, but to clear down doesn't make any sense in English, and that's why we have to paraphrase and coming up with, sometimes, coming up with these uh, definitions of words and, and justifying the way they're built from their um, Greek and Latin elements. Okay, so declaration, the state of declaring the state of setting down clearly, and there it is, a declaration 